All right, good morning. My microphone works. <laughs> Thanks for being here for an early session. Um, our focus this morning is on philanthropy. Um, and uh, you've been in many sessions uh, about the topic of democracy. How are we, how are we um, faring as a, as a resilient society, but also a robust democracy? And, and you know, I'm, I'm going to give you the good news, and that is that we've got two kind of singular assets uh, on, which to, on which to build. And the first is the assumption of an active citizenry. Um, and absent that, we, we worry. <laughs> but much of what philanthropy is about is supporting an active and engaged citizenry. The second asset we have to build on is that we have this sort of unique form of self-governance in which the public, private, and civic se sector each has a role to play and a history of working together. Uh, and again, philanthropy is often engaged in catalyzing partnerships across sectors. So to, this, is the, this is the cheery, this is the much more cheerful session uh, than others that you might have had. Um, I, I'm going to, my name's Jane Wales. I'm vice president of the Aspen Institute. My background is serving in gov government and also in, 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 uh, in foundations. And uh, now, I'm, now I'm here at the Aspen Institute. I'm going to just give you a quick bio on our three speakers, because it's a, it's a remarkable combination of people who uh, have very different foundations with very different focuses, but a, a very similar approach to it. Um, and that's something, something called systems change. Not, on, not everybody calls it that, uh, but it is, it's about getting at the, the root causes of a problem, not, not at the, its manifestations. Um, you're going to hear from, from three of us, and we're just going to hop, hop on down. One is Rodney Foxworth, and Rodney being the only male on the stage, you know which one's Rodney. Um, <laughs> uh, he's CEO of something called Common Future, and Common Future matchmakes. Um, uh, let me just see if I've got this right, because I may be confused with something else, but um, it, it engages in grant making, it engages in impact investing or equitable investing, and in public policy. Um, he also founded Invested Impact, and that's what I started to say, which is a nonprofit consulting firm that sort of connects um, philanthropic capital and impact investing capital to imaginative social entrepreneurs, particularly underrepresented from underrepresented communities. Um, what I love about about Rodney is that he is. Um, uh, that he starts, and, and his organization, and every organization he's been a part of, starts with a compelling vision. It doesn't start with what we want to get rid of. It starts with what we aspire to, to build. Um, and so you'll, you'll feel that, I suspect, when we, when we talk. Uh, Carol Stern is all the way down um, there. And um, she, is, she used to be, before she headed up uh, the Walton Family Foundation, she worked for, um, she was CEO of, of UNICEF USA. So as you can imagine, um, the, the health and well-being of children, uh, top of mind for her, but she's also always been uh, a strong and powerful advocate of civil rights and of, of, of education um, that is inclusive. Um, the, under her leadership at, at Walton, um, I, I've been particularly struck by the degree to which uh, she's focused on ensuring that, that all the grant making is informed. By, by those they seek to serve. Um, so it's, we'll talk a little bit about something called proximate philanthropy. Um, I, I would also say that when, when Carol talks about inclusion, she defines it more broadly. So I'm gonna let you answer that question rather than speak for you. But, um, but it's one of the things I think is particularly special about, about Carol. Jen, um, right, right beside me, uh, heads up the Bush Foundation. Um, and I will find the notes that, that remind me of everything she does. Um, but the Bush Foundation, I think one of the things that's really uh, interesting about it, I mean, it's, it's, it's based in Minnesota, it's focused on the Dakotas and, and several Indian nations, Native nations, um, and, and she's combined grant making with, um, with I, you'll hear about this, floating a social bond. So we're looking forward to that. Then finally, I'm gonna just single out somebody in the audience. Um, Mark Kramer, uh, who founded FSG, which is a nonprofit consultant, a consultancy, consults with foundations and businesses on how they can advance uh, social change. Uh, but there was an article he has been writing uh, about systems change for quite a while, along with a colleague, John Kenya. So if we get it wrong, Mark, we're going to call <laughs> on you to be, do the cleanup act, okay? 
So, but I, I want to start. I, I want to start with you, Jen, um, and get a sense of how you think about how you approach uh, system change yourself and your foundation. Well, I love to talk about that. I think um, you know systems change is happening all around us all the time, um, and. Um, foundations are changing the world and changing our lives around us, and we don't always see it. Um, I actually teach a, a graduate class on philanthropic history and strategy, and it's such a fun class to teach because there's so many stories, so many ways in which philanthropy is making a difference in the course of our country's history and also in our, our daily lives that we're not aware of. It's like an underground history, and I think, you know, in your own life, if you've strap your kid into a car seat and uh, they've gone to school and had a school lunch or you filed for the earned income tax credit or you've gone to see a nurse practitioner and that nurse practitioner gave you a pap smear. Um, you know, I love the example of the white lines on the outside of roads that keep us all safe, which was a philanthropic intervention. You know, it's all around us all the time. And I think in a week like we've just had, where we have really, really big national developments, uh, Supreme Court decisions, it's an opportunity to actually see what difference does philanthropy make and how are, how are foundations affecting um, our direction as, as a country. And of course, you have philanthropy on both sides of any particular issue, like abortion, like guns. Um, but you also can see in the decisions this week the result of a very intentional, decades-long, philanthropic-driven effort to change our judici judicial system. Um, it's, it's philanthropy and systems change, you know, right before our eyes. And there are a lot of foundations that um, had an impact on that. But one that I think is a particularly interesting case study is the John Olin Foundation, um, which focused on lawyers and changing how lawyers think, how they think about the law, how they think about the world. And the Olin Foundation did a whole bunch of really interesting things. They had a lot of strategies. Um, but one of the most famous now things they've done was a grant back in 1982 to a student club that wanted to um, come together on three law school campuses. Um, it was a student club with faculty advisors with names like Bork and Scalia. Um, you know, Olin made that grant, and that's the Federalist Society, right? And now, uh, 40 years later, six, tenths, six ninths of the Supreme Court um, consider themselves part of the Federalist Society. Um, there's a lot to learn from that case study, I think, in how systems change happen, a lot from, to learn from other case studies. I mean, they were thinking big, they were thinking long term, they were flexible. Um, but the thing I'd love to really highlight, because it really reflects how I think about systems change, is the degree to which they focused on people. Right? Systems are people. <laughs> They're not abstractions. Systems are the result of how the people in that system behave. So if you want to change a system, you have to change how people within that system act. You have to motivate them to think differently support them to act differently, and that's how systems change happens. So you're, you're making me want to jump to Carol. Yeah. Let me just say why. Um, you work on, on schools, on, on the charter movement. You work on climate change. Um, in, in fact, everything you've worked on in your life has, um, ha has required change on the international level, on the national level, but also on the individual level, how you act. So talk a little bit about, about sort of the depth but, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing because, you know, systems change is, for, in my mind, is synonymous, you know, with strategic philanthropy. It is understanding that change doesn't happen overnight, but at least I can speak for the Walton Family Foundation. It is long-term thinking, but the ability to iterate every year because in every moment, you know, we have a weekly program meeting and that we're actually talking about, okay, we're keeping the eye on the prize of where we want to end, but what's happening in the world around us that's going to impact how we're thinking about that so that we are iterative at all times. I think the big issue for us, though, is for the system that we're most trying to change is kind of a redefinition of collaboration to get us to all the other things. You know, 
for many, many years, especially I believe in our sector, collaboration meant let's go out and find people with common ground and then we'll come together and we'll work on the issue. We haven't gotten very far that way. So we really need to think about instead of common ground, you know, something Tim Shriver, and I'm stealing his word, calls common solutions. If we can keep our eye on where we want to land, we can sit at the table with people we don't agree with and figure out how we get there. And it's a challenge because you've got to get your listening skills up really well and your patience skills up really well. But I think those are two of the skills that have been really absent in our leadership development programs that all of us are supporting. And is really, how do we sit at that table? How do we hear what the other side's saying? Frustration, because I can speak even from a personal level of friends who I've worked in civil rights with my entire career, in other areas in climate change and other things who say, well, if that person thinks that way, that's not somebody I want to have dinner with. That's not somebody I want to sit at the table with. That's not how you bring about change. We have to find ways to come back to the table. And that's at the heart of our um, strategic plan right now is that we are going to look around. We're going to listen. We're going to learn. And then we're going to help to lead. And that involves also developing fellowship skills, not just leadership skills, being able to say, I want to look, listen, learn before I lead. Rodney, your, your organization is, is all about listening and leading, um, but it's also about uh, something that is a, an attribute of systems change, and that is changing relationships, uh, and within that, changing power dynamics. Talk about how you approach that. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for the question, and um, I want to be I want to emphasize that we're not a foundation, right? So I'm a bit of an odd duck on this conversation. Um, we're a public charity, and we work a lot with foundations. And I think the question to your, your, your question around power dynamics and relationships, we actually leverage our own resources to be able to empower and share our power with other institutions, specifically community leaders and community-based organizations across the US that are really looking to develop and assert their own economic power and just in self-determination. And so from that vantage point, we really take an approach of how can we get most proximate to communities that have been most adversely impacted by economic and racial injustice? One of the things that begins with is that my team, my colleagues are majority women, majority women of color, many of whom have direct experiences every single day as it pertains to a lot of the things that have come up over the last week, right? So that's a shift in terms of who gets to make decisions even in our own organization, right? And so one of the things that, you know, Jen, you mentioned this earlier in your comments in terms of motivating people to make different decisions. And so we've done a lot of that work, working with over 50 place-based foundations across the US to help influence their own decision-making in terms of how they create strategies on how they best leverage their own resources and capital to provide more opportunity and power for individuals and institutions that are most impacted by these injustices. That's hard work. And we, you can't have a conversation with, about systems change without acknowledging power dynamics. So, for example, the majority of Americans support some form of gun control, support abortion access and care. But if individuals and institutions that disproportionately wield the power to make the decisions don't agree, then it almost makes it a bit immaterial. <laughs> And so what we, what we tried to do is to give the voice and power to those who have not been able to, who've been excluded, quite frankly, in these decisions, right, in, in their own communities. And so what that looks like for us is to be able to acknowledge that we have power, all right? And that's really, I think that's really challenging for a number of folks on my team because, again, women of color particularly are always excluded, all right, from, from having decision-making opportunities and having the ability to assert power. And so that's even a shift to be able to say, these are individuals that are most proximate, that have been most impacted, they have a devel they've developed expertise because of their lived experiences, right? They've been wrestling with these issues, these challenges for their entire lives. So how do we actually make sure that they have power? How do we give up power? How do we share power? How do we leverage our relationships with others, including the, you know, the many foundations that we work with, to be partners and help to guide them in actually being able to empower and share power as well? And so that's how we think about it, uh, okay. Jane. And we, we really, again, getting you know, practical to really demonstrate for us what it means to assert something. So 
when the, when the pandemic began in the U.S., we took we took 10% of our operating budget, for example, and said we're going to utilize the, this capital specifically for communities that have been most impacted, and we had a democratic kind of process to do that. One of the reasons why we did that was because we wanted to power, we wanted to like signal that if a, a, a public charity could do that, we wanted to make sure that foundations and others could actually step up as well, which we saw a number of institutions step up and do that. But that took that took our team because they were they were experiencing it. Many of my colleagues, their family members are frontline workers that did not have the luxury of working from home the last two and a half years. They were in the fight literally every single day, and so they were impacted by that. And so because of that, they were able to say, we're going to assert these resources in a different type of way. So Jen, you have a sort of whopping example of, of using your resources in, in a certain way, in a way that, that does shift power. And I'm thinking about your the, the social bond yeah. and, and what, what a social bond is to begin with, but also why you, why you created one and what kind of decision-making process did it lead to? Yeah, so our um, decision to issue bonds um, was related to a larger question for us about how we fit into wealth inequality. Um, in the US. So there are some ways where as foundations, we get to pick what issues we want to work on, right? We get to pick what systems we're engaging in, right? We want to think about education. We want to think about homelessness. We want to think about environment. Um, and we don't get to choose, in my opinion, whether we are part of the conversation, part of the system related to wealth inequality in the US. Um, for me to have the job I have, Someone had to make enough money, <laughs> enough wealth, to pay somebody else to give it away, right? We are born of wealth inequality. And if we're not accepting that, understanding that, and having a conversation about what it means for us as institutions, um, then I think um, it's going to be a challenge for our field over long term in a, in a whole lot of ways. And I think there are a variety of ways to to think about what that means for you um, and your institution. But for us, um, I spent a lot of time really trying to understand how we got to where we are um, around wealth inequality, and particularly related to racial wealth gaps um, in this country, really understanding how much it matters, how much wealth actually predicts, defines um, your future, how much wealth is generational, how much it matters um, what resources your family have to the opportunities you're able to take advantage of, to the, the hardships you're able to weather, and then really understanding the history. I mean, I think most everybody has some general sense of how we got to where we are in terms of race-based um, wealth gaps, but I learned a lot. I mean, really going deeper, you know, you know about um, slavery, of course, you know about taking land, but really understanding you know, for our greatest hits public policies through the years, the ones that we cite as examples of how we've built wealth in the country, like the Homestead Act, like work around um, mortgages, um, they've had huge impact on who's been able to develop wealth in this country. And you have disadvantage and advantage that have accumulated over years. And so for us, we were really saying, what what do we do because of the ways that we've benefited from the system? And we give away money, like that's what we do. <laughs> we give away money. We also give away money with a racial equity lens and we give money related to wealth gaps. So what's, what's different, what's more? How could we think about um, you know, acting differently, acting bigger related to, to um, wealth gaps? And I mentioned earlier my philosophy or my feeling that you know, for systems to change, the people within them have to think differently and have to act differently. They have to think differently about their role, and they have to be willing to do something bigger. They have to be willing sometimes to give something up. Um, so the idea, the specifics of what we did was actually inspired in part by um, Edgar Villanueva's suggestion in Decolonizing Wealth about every foundation giving away 10% of their assets to build um, wealth for native and black individuals in this country, and that's what we did. So we issued the bonds, um, and we put out a call, really, for steward organizations to receive the money from us um, and figure out how do we want to distribute it um, to Native people, to black people in the communities that, that we serve to really support them in building wealth, those moments of wealth building activity like buying a home, going to school, starting a business, um, and that is what we've done. 
And this is $100 million? This is $100 million. Um, and how, what is the decision-making process for the deployment of those, of those dollars? It is wholly up to those steward organizations, 100%, to decide um, with the communities they serve um, how to disperse that, that money. And, and it will be very different. We have one steward organization working with black communities, one working with native communities, and definitions of wealth are really different um, across communities and, and what would be the right spirit um, in which to give money differs across communities. So we have, we have entrusted it completely to those steward organizations to decide um, how they handle it. Yeah. And Carol, I, a big part of the way the way the Walton Family Foundation works is to be out in the field, listening to the voices, elevating those voices. Tell us how you go about it, and I'm going to have a second question, and that is that you second focus question, huh? that you Please. focus on on <laughs> rural populations. That's part of what Jen does, but uh, give us a sense of the particular needs when it comes to wealth building in, in rural sure. populations. So the um, Sam and Helen Walton, who were our founders believe very strongly that solutions are best found in the communities you serve. So the history of our foundation has always been at the community level. And our entire strategic plan, even in, in the moment, is written around being at the table to learn with our grantees, not to direct what our grantees do, or for them to be completely just go do whatever you want. It is a partnership, and that's how we view our philanthropy. Um, in the Delta in particular, where we've been for many years, there is an extreme wealth gap. This is a, you know, a rural area where initial investments were heavily in the education area, but then it became more of a brain drain. So there were investments in education, we were improving systems, getting better access to college. A lot of the people who were benefiting from that were then leaving the Delta. So now we are exploring working with those in the community, what we do to bring certain things back to the Delta. And it's been a really fascinating experiment. I mean, we're looking also, you know, we've just spent a year speaking with 70 different groups in the Delta, in, and actually in a very isolated area of the Delta, because we're kind of honing in on three counties right now. Um, and these 70 groups are directing our philanthropy. And it's been a very exciting project. We're learning a lot. Um, you know, and we're, we're also studying even the efficacy of, you know, we're doing a huge research project on what might we bring in crops that are drying up in other communities to the Delta. How do we take farming and bring back pride in farming and show it as the tech industry that it really is today? How do we form collectives so that the small farmer can participate and compete in a big farm world? There's a variety of different projects happening simultaneously. It sounds joyful as well as impactful. It's, it is joyful. You know, I, I was out in um, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and, I, and I'll tell you, we're also doing some things for us to learn. We take, um, we have an internship program with the university in Pine Bluff, which is one of the historical black colleges. We recognized the kids coming from there are bright, they're capable, but they are in a competitive world where they're not getting picked for a Goldman Sachs interview, for a JP Morgan I mean, internship. So we started looking at what could we do to change that. And we decided that the best thing we could do would be to create an internship program between sophomore and junior year so that for junior to senior year, they could be more competitive. And if you, for example, we have five who work in with our investment team. If you work on the investment team for the wealthiest family in America, then you will have an opportunity probably to get an internship at one of the big competitors the following year. So we, we do set it up as an academic program. There is a professor who leads this entire program. There's learning. There are some of you in the room who are participating in that program. You know, um, people like Melody Hobson are lending her time to this. I mean, it's been really exciting to see the network that we're creating, not just the learning experience, but the network that these kids will be able to take advantage of and proof positive from our first year. There are some in the cohort who are working in New York this summer. Um, so it's been a really exciting process to work both at a very smaller level with a group of kids who are teaching us so much, and then at the community level with 70 organizations, and then at a larger level with foundations working in rural America who are teaching us a lot. So, Rodney, I'm going to take it up a level, and that is that you've, you've written and talked about sort of rebalancing the social contract, developing a new social contract. Um, tell us what that looks like and how that would sort of fundamentally change all systems. 
So before I answer that, I do want to raise a couple of things that have already been raised in the conversation. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so Jen, you pointed out earlier that, you know, it's about people. Um, to change systems, you need to have, actually motivate and influence people. And I think one of the things it's important to, given this conversation about philanthropy and systems change, within the field of philanthropy, and I'm going to speak more specifically to the institution of philanthropy mm -hmm. in this moment, um, there is so much room for improvement in terms of the power dynamics themselves. So specifically, when you look at staff leadership and board governance of foundations, because of all the systemic and historical context that Jen offered earlier, um, you're going to see the majority of decision makers are not individuals that look like me, right? Um, that don't look like the, the leadership and staffing of the organizations that Bush Foundation allocated, you know, the steward organizations, um, both of which I know and, and work with and incredible organizations. And so the act of really sharing that type of resource, fully committing that and giving up the power to individuals and institutions that would likely never have an opportunity to actually wield that type of power in their, on behalf of their own communities, that is something that is a systems change within philanthropy um, that is, is quite necessary as well, right? And so I just wanted to name that because I think, you know, we, we can't have the conversation without the power dynamics within philanthropy itself, right? And what kind of decisions get made because of maybe a distance, um, a lack of understanding um, of, or of lived experience as it pertains to some of these issues. And so as it, as it, as it pertains to the, the, uh, a new social contract, the, this, this country is, is very much an idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is constantly, you know, the, the quote of the, the, the arc of the, mo uh, the moral universe uh, moves towards justice, that's only if we're actually actively engaged in moving the arc that direction. And we're seeing over the last week, and it's gonna continue, um, what happens when there's regression, right? And so I think as we're moving towards being a country that is majority people of color, more diverse in terms of what we're assumed to mean to be the status quo of what it means to be an American, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's just really the opportunity for, for us to really assert uh, decisions and power to communities that are already here, have been here before, <laughs> right? I mean, talking about indigenous communities. Um, and so that is sort of, you know, rewiring that the expectations and the normative approaches that we, we consistently revert back to, we need to rewire that. We have to rewrite that. And I think philanthropy has a, an opportunity to do that because, again, within the, the wider frame, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, at least in perception, because I'm not in foundation, so I don't want to open up that a little bit. But in terms of when we look at the pace that government can move, when we look at the pace that even corporations can move, philanthropy has an opportunity to actually lead on what expectations can be in our society. And so we've seen that, obviously. But I think what we're talking about in terms of the moral arc towards justice, that's where I think philanthropy has a, a substantial role to play. And it'll be a question of how do you wield that power appropriately and equitably? And that is the question, right? But I think we wield that power by being the conveners. That you know that the power that we bring, I think, to the table that is exceptional for for the foundation world is that we can be the conveners. You know, I, I was kidding yesterday. You know, if we're funding you, you're going to show up at the table. So, you know, there's an opportunity to bring like-minded organizations together very easily. But there's also the opportunity to bring unlike together through that. We also have to stop thinking of work exclusively in our sector. We have to form partnerships outside of our sector. And we saw that. I mean, the quick response to COVID was the efforts of three sectors coming together. It was government, philanthropy, and corporate sectors, all three together solving that problem. And we saw how it expedited everything. You know, I, um, I it was we in our prep meeting, I was talking about when I was CEO of UNICEF and I had to face the challenge of the storm in Puerto Rico. We did not have staff in Puerto Rico. It was the first time I had to respond to you know, a natural disaster where I had no one on the ground. And I reached out to one of the governors in our country who had actually flown down immediately and asked, what do you need? Because I thought that was the right way to approach the problem. And I called that governor and he said, well, I've cleared out you know, warehouse space at an airport, and I've got an attorney general down there vetting organizations for distribution of supplies, 
but I've never done storm relief before. Carol, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, well, you know, I'm the CEO of UNICEF. I know what they need, you know, and I know actually where it is, if we could access it, but I might need you to really clear custom stuff for me really quick to get it there, because it's in Italy at the moment. And I have to figure out then, what are we missing? So we then, the CEO of UPS had just joined the UNICEF board. He literally was coming in for his orientation that day. We never oriented him. <laughs> we sat him down and we said, okay, what do you got? And he said, well, not only do I have planes and ships and things that we can use to get it from Italy to Puerto Rico, but on the ground, I've got 500 trucks and 500 drivers, and they have fuel in them, which if you remember after Puerto Rico, nobody had fuel. And he said, I will give you the drivers and the trucks if the attorney general will tell us where to take it, and if you will set up a system for distribution, and if the governor will get work with the government to clear the customs regulations, and we were the first ones to reach people in Puerto Rico. None of us could do that alone. So, the biggest message you know, the, that I got excited about joining the panel today is that's the role of philanthropy, is we have tentacles all over the place. And our role is to be the convener and to say, who's got the expertise? We don't have the answers. We have the ability to bring together people who could put the pieces together. And that's what the Walton Family Foundation is really focusing on right now. How do we do that? How do we set that table? And how do we make sure, as you said, Rodney, that all voices are at that table. Right. The, uh, 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 some of the foundations that kind of pioneered cross-sector collaboration, I think of Ford, I think of Rockefeller, um, you know, way back in the 60s, <laughs> um, what, they'll, what they'll tell you is that lesson number one is that you need to have the beneficiaries, you know, those you're seeking to serve, at the table in the design phase, <coughs> not just in the evaluation phase. I think it's just a, a very important lesson to make. So it's, it's convener, but it's also a catalyst. I mean, it's, it's you know, frequently, you're, you're, you're in the leadership position in the sense that you're, you're catalyzing uh, collaboration, but you know that the R&D capacity or the logistics capacity is in the private sector. Why reinvent that? You know, you know that you need exactly. policies, regulations, et cetera. How do you do that? So, so Jen, because you, you work primarily on the, on the local and regional level, do you have those experiences of working across, you know, not just within um, the, the, the world you serve and within the communities, but also across sector? For sure, it's actually in our purpose statement. The Bush Foundation purpose statement is to inspire and support creative problem solving within and across sectors <laughs> to make the region better for everyone. And it is that idea that um, you know, the biggest challenges we have today are beyond the scope of any institution, they're beyond the scope of any sector um, to address. And each of our sectors, so government, business, nonprofits, um, have different strengths, different things that they can do better than others, and different challenges, different limitations on what they can do. And so I think um, when we have those big, complicated issues, I think our best opportunity is thinking about what's the, what's the cross-sector opportunity here, or at least understanding everybody's role and how they can complement and amplify um, each other to make a difference. Yeah, and I think that's, that's been shifting a lot. I was going to ask one more question of all of you um, and then turn to questions from the audience. Um, but we've, we've talked about the role of policy. We've talked about um, uh, the way resource flows might change. Um, and, uh, but, but part of, uh, I'm sorry, systems change philanthropy is a focus on changing mindsets, the way we look at a problem. Um, and that is part of that is, is putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. But there's, there's more to that. So I'd love to hear um, from all three of you how you think about the changing of mindsets in order to achieve lasting change. I'll start with you and we'll walk right down. Yeah. Well, I really, really believe that. I believe that um, some of the most effective philanthropy you can do is sort of hearts and minds philanthropy, changing the way somebody um, is thinking about their role in the world, about others, about what they can do. Um, I think um, there are a lot of ways to think about doing that, and those can be you know, in really um, small interactions at a community level that can be you know, fundamentally rethinking the role of um, the federal government, and we see foundations doing you know, the, the full gamut. But my, my own definition, actually, of really effective philanthropy um, is based on how much change happens beyond 
the thing that you bought <laughs> with the grant, beyond mm -hmm. what the money was used for for the grant. So thinking, you know, what are those investments that have the largest possible reverberative effect um, within a system, within a community, within a society? And I think overwhelmingly, when you look at the history of the philanthropy, those interventions are mindset interventions. Yeah. It is changing the way somebody thinks about their responsibility, their role, their opportunities, um, and what they do with them. Rodney. Yeah, I think that's, I agree with that. And I think also, Jen, you, we were talking about this a little bit before, because Bush Foundation also has invest in individuals. Yeah. And I think when you were talking about like the founding of the Federalist Society and all the decisions that we're seeing over the last uh, few weeks, and we'll unfortunately likely continue to see, um, there's been significant investment into individuals and ideas and, and weaving together um, a new status quo that is enabled by those individuals. And so I think one of the things for philanthropy, particularly those that are really see their work as really driving the, the moral arc of the universe towards justice, is to also think differently about how you're resourcing communities and individuals to actually do the work of shifting beliefs and influencing beliefs as well. Because I don't always, I don't necessarily believe that foundations in particular are like best positioned for that, right? Like that's, cause that's, that's a particular set of skills and expertise. Um, and at the same time, there's resources that foundations do have. And so how do you, how are you leveraging your resources to actually identify and work with those that are most um, informed and most impacted that can actually help to shape some of the narratives, some of the influence work? Right. So that's where I see sort of the foundation's role. Yeah, I'm going to be really quick and not repeat. Um, I think the other place is to make sure that we have a voice. And that is something that, again, in, in our new strategy, it is a, a very specific strategic decision to market a voice of our own as well and to speak on behalf of the things that we are really invested in and to change how we evaluate our grant making also so that we're measuring impact, not counting numbers. You know, it's not whether you did 14 programs if you promised 14 programs. It is you were doing 14 programs in pursuit of what? So if you did seven and you got there, hallelujah. And, and really to really start to say, how do we measure impact, not move into numbers? So we're going to turn to the audience. I just say that I, I, this form, this way of going about philanthropy, is particularly interesting to me because, in the process of solving a problem, you're also seeking to build social capital, build agency, a sense that yes, I can make a difference, um, and uh, and therefore a more resilient society. So. We we'll need the mic right up here. Lots of questions here. <laughs> and then we're going to go back there. Oh, oh we'll be doing putting. Hello. Um, so my name is Alejandro. And I had a question, but you mentioned Puerto Rico, and I'm from Puerto Rico, which means that if you guys are cold, I'm freezing. <laughs> <laughs> um, Want the jacket? <laughs> I left it at the hotel, but that's fine. I'm <laughs> from Minnesota, and I'm cold too. So. <laughs> um, so um, so yeah, so you mentioned Puerto Rico, and I mean, I don't want to talk about Puerto Rico because I want the question to be useful for most people, but I think I can use that as an example of something that happens a lot, and I've been hearing a lot in this conference, and that is, um, who who got to define the discourse of what we needed back then, and <coughs> where resources had to go, was the leadership of established institutions, government, established nonprofits. Who are doing great work, but they're not necessarily the community leaders who are not organized or the small nonprofits. Um, and when we're talking about system change, I think it's very important to, you know, everyone talks about that they have to be at the table, but how do we, it, it's very difficult to find the leaders who are not organized. Um, and you have to ask a thousand people before you get to that person. Um, so I guess my question is how, how, how do we, and now, and back then I was in a small nonprofit and now I'm in, a, in the funder position. Um, and I wanna make sure I don't make the same mistakes that happened back then. So I guess my question to you is, how do you make sure that, um, you know, you talk with your units of user, right? Um, that's a like, very high position. How do, how do you make sure that you engage with those little people who would never have access to a huge institution like UNICEF um, and who are not organized enough to, to have the capital to and network to, to reach you? 
So, so rather than go, go back to UNICEF, I, I can speak for the Walton Family Foundation that, again, part of why we do strategic philanthropy in terms of long term is to establish ourselves as a trusted neighbor in the communities we work and to work through the trusted neighbors that are our trusted neighbors in those communities so that, you know, I, I was just in Pine Bluff. We, it, we don't want a, um, you know, a show and tell in the school that we're funding. We want to stop by and see is it really happening. But we also want to re meet with the religious leaders in that community and hear what's going on in the parish. We want to meet with the women's club that's in that community and hear what's going on. We just built something in the state of Arkansas, which is one-stop shopping for Arkansas small nonprofits who are trying to access federal funds. They don't have the wherewithal to access federal funds. So we are creating a one-stop shop. You can walk in and find it, are you eligible? And we will help you to write the application and see you through to receive. So it is by creating the systems that will provide access for the little organization. Can, can I quickly yes. say, um, so Alejandro, thank you for the question. I also would maybe, from my vantage point, I would try to rebalance it and suggest that I don't believe that it is actually difficult to find those different voices. I think where, what I alluded to earlier is, what, speaking specifically in the US, um, the majority of white individuals, for example, only know white individuals. <laughs> and I mean, that we're such a segregated country. And so that shows up in power and it shows up in decision making. And so one of the questions is, how do you actually make sure that those who are in governance and have the power within institutions also have, are, are, are different? Because to your point, Alejandro, I mean, this country was founded, white men, right? <laughs> We're, and, and, and so we can, I don't want to get into all that. But, the, <laughs> but recognizing that point, though, like just as a tangible example, my former organization, Invested Impact, 39 of the, of the social entrepreneurs that we invested in, or sorry, of the 39 uh, social entrepreneurs that we invested in, 33 were black women. Now, if you look at the data, it's, un it's very unlikely for black women to receive any sort of financial investment. But why was it that we were able to do that? It wasn't hard work for us, because our team had access and ours in relationship to. And so I just want to raise that as an opportunity for foundations to really rethink on how they even um, have individuals in the governance roles. So we've, we've finished the time that was to be used for wide, for, um, for, for, screening uh, for, for live streaming. I'm sorry, for live streaming this thing. But there are a couple more questions. So I just want to take one Can year. Can I add something on that one before you? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to take up. one okay. year because I promised Tim. Okay, so if great. we go over that side. And then thank you for this program. And stay to ask questions directly, please. Over there, the other side. Yeah. No. Oops. No, no, no. Back back a little. <laughs> the question. That's this gentleman back the gentleman here. Back, back. Sorry. The question to Carol. I think you also want to do it. Right. Uh, the question, Carol, you, you mentioned something about HBCUs. And, and the issue for HBCUs has always been access. And you sound, you sort of uh, mentioned a program, but as an aside, where you use representation and resources to create access. But you basically provided access to five. Why not leverage that on a much larger scale, since it seems to work? So, so I totally Carol, agree Carol, with Carol, you. we're going to take one. This gentleman who stood up before just takes that question, and then you'll then we'll answer both, and then we'll come to a close. Okay. And I'm happy to answer. More, more for you. It's, um, you've been investing in charter schools for a long time. I'm just curious as to how that in, investing philosophy, <coughs> excuse me, has evolved over the over those experiences. Okay, let me answer the first question. Totally agree with you. We'd love to take it to scale. We started the program a year ago. As, as a pilot program. We've just done our proof positive on it, so we're in our second summer, and our goal is to expand the program. So we do hope to take it to scale, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, to the charter school, we definitely hold true to the belief that all children learn differently, that what is good for one child may not be the right environment for another child, that education is an immediate need, that it's a right, not a privilege. So all of that holds for us. And we believe that every mom, dad, aunt, uncle, whatever, whoever the child's caretaker is, should have access to, to choose the school that's most appropriate and have that not be just for the affluent. So what we've learned through the work that we've done is obviously some schools have succeeded better than others. Some communities more receptive to the 
idea and the concept, some unions more receptive to the idea and the concept. And our, so we continue to look for the opportunity to create schools that are different options. So Jen, know. final word, and then folks can just talk to, talk to folks on the, on the side. So Well, those questions, I think, were so specific to Carol. Or you want just final word in general? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I will. Use the power wise. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the power. Um, I would say, you know, it's sort of related to a question earlier that we say sometimes good ideas can come from everywhere. And I think a lot of people in philanthropy will say that. But I think, how are we really organized in a way that shows we believe that? and are working to make sure that we are finding and supporting ideas from everywhere. I think one is, can people apply at all? Uh, but then are we really reaching out and making sure people have true access and, and ability to get the resources to do the work that they think is necessary in their communities? And that, that requires you know, an, an openness, a belief, but it also requires structural changes in how we do our work in philanthropy. So thank you so much for being here.